Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We're going to start on page 89. And this is the last session, and it is incidentally my favorite session. It's my favorite session because this is where I do most of my AA work today. I do most of my AA work in working with others and applying these principles in all my affairs. And as a result of the first 11 steps, I think that the greatest promise in AA actually happens in the 12th step. It says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. Not as one result, not as some result, not as a result, but the result of these steps is nothing more and nothing less than a vital spiritual awakening, right? And it's interesting that the 12th step has three distinct parts. The first part is the spiritual awakening, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And as a result of that, I'm charged with a certain responsibility. The responsibility I'm charged with is to carry this message to other alcoholics and to carry this message and practice these principles that I've learned in the first 11 steps in every area of my life, right? And I've had the spiritual experience that we talked about. And I know some of you, how many people here have had a spiritual experience? Spiritual experience, spiritual awakening? The appendix two, as I said on spiritual experience, and we didn't have time to turn there, but in the back of the book was an appendix that they added after the writing of the first edition when they reprinted the book in 1950 for the second edition. Bill says that it's nothing more and nothing less than a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. And I've had that, right? My compulsion to drink was removed. The spirit within me came awake, right? And now that I've had this spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, as I said, I have a certain obligation. As a matter of fact, that I had a sponsor that said, Rob, it's kind of like building a house and installing electrical wiring, right? He said, let's say you and I were to build a house and we wanted to run electricity into the house. So we ran all these conduits and cables all throughout the house, put in plugs and outlets and light bulb fixtures. We got it all wired up, but we never flipped the switch. He said, that's what working the first 11 steps without doing service work in Alcoholics Anonymous is like. It's like building this great house with this great wiring system and never flipping the switch. Because for me, service work and sponsorship is the switch that I flip that turns on the power of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you have never done it, you are missing the greatest part of AA. Because all of the first 11 steps are designed to do is get me out of the way enough that I can perform what I believe is God's intended purpose for every single one of us. And they tricked me. I thought it was really all about me. I thought it was all about what I was going to get. And all about what I needed. And all about my feelings and my thinking. And I got to the end of the 12 steps. And they said, no, it's really not about you. It's really about helping someone else. It's really about loving God and His kids. right? And I thought, you duped me. right? But because I didn't have any alternatives... I listened to my sponsor, and my sponsor was a wise sponsor, and he pushed me right into working with others right away, right? And I know that there are some people that you may hear in the fellowship, oh, you should wait two years or three years or five years or ten years or thirty years before you sponsor anybody, right? How many people have heard stuff like that, right? Oh, you should wait two years to sponsor anybody. You know my answer to that is? I am forever grateful that Bill Wilson didn't wait two years to go find Dr. Bob, because none of us would be here. I am forever grateful that Ebby Thatcher didn't wait two years to go 12-step Bill Wilson in his house in December of 1934 because none of us would be here. I am forever grateful that Bill and Dr. Bob didn't wait two years to go visit Bill Dodson, who was AA number three in the hospital in Akron City Hospital. Dr. Bob was sober two days when they finally went to visit Bill Dodson. And the depiction of that is in most AA clubhouses. It's called The Man in the Bed. And it's the depiction of the first time the two alcoholics worked with another alcoholic and all three of them were able to maintain permanent sobriety. Right? What a great gift. And my sponsor said that if you've worked the first 11 steps of this program 
and you've been given the gift of sobriety, the gift of a spiritual experience, the gift of the compulsion being removed, and you don't work with other alcoholics? He said, I got news for you, Slick. You're going to pay. Right? You see, I, there's, you don't get anything for nothing around here. Right? And so I have been given the gift of sobriety, and I have a moral obligation and responsibility to carry that message to other alcoholics. If you want to know why I'm here today, that's why I'm here today. I'm here because there were people in Alcoholics Anonymous that were in service when I got here that took the time to do things just like this so I could sit way back there in the back and listen and absorb and learn about myself and learn about alcoholism and learn what I needed to do in order to stay sober. And I applied those things and my life changed. And as I said in the big book, where they write short, we work short. And where they write long, we work long. And if you think about it, they've just covered step 3 through 11 in two chapters. Think about that, right? 3 through 11, two chapters, right? And now they give us a whole chapter devoted entirely to step 12. What does that mean? It means that there's a lot of work for me to do in step 12. There's a lot of work for me to do in helping others. There's a lot of work for me to do in carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous wherever I can. And he gives us some practical ideas for how to do that. People ask me all the time, they say, well, how do you take somebody, how do you work with a newcomer, right? And I say, we have a whole chapter on it called Working with Others. And there are some people that will tell you, well, sponsorship doesn't appear in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is not true, okay? The word sponsor does not appear in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is because in 1939, when the book was published, the book was the 12-step call, Okay? And they would send it in the mail. You'd send your $3.50, and it came with a money-back guarantee, and they would send you a copy of the book, right? So if you're in Los Angeles or Atlanta or Orlando in 1939, you're going to send your money, and you're going to get a copy of the book, right? So if they wrote in the book, get with your sponsor and do the third step prayer, are you going to be able to do it? No. If they say, get with your sponsor and share your inventory, are you going to be able to do it? No, right? So they didn't use the word sponsor. However, the principle of sponsorship is all over the big book. And what we know from AA history is that in the three groups that they had in Cleveland and Akron and New York, they had a sponsorship ethic. We talked about Dr. Bob taking guys through the steps and this type of sponsorship today. Incidentally, that story is the story of a guy by the name of Earl Treat. He got sober in 1937 in Akron, Ohio, two years before the book was written. And we, he calls Dr. Bob his sponsor. Okay? It's very clear. So they had a sponsorship ethic in the groups. But they didn't put the word sponsor in the book in the text because they didn't want people to be hung up on that and not be able to do the work. Because they didn't know how far-reaching this would be. As a matter of fact, I don't believe our founders could have ever foreseen a time where there would be a day when there would be 500 meetings in the greater Orlando area every week. Where I come from in San Francisco, there are 2,000 meetings a week, right? In Los Angeles, where the Pacific Group is, there are 5,000 meetings a week, right? And so literally, there are people that go to meetings, they start at 6 a.m. and they go to meetings all day long, until midnight. And then they get up the next day and they go to meetings all day long, right? And so people have gotten the idea that they can stay sober on the fellowship. That doesn't work for a guy like me. What keeps me sober is doing this, right? And it tells me now that I've had the spiritual experience, I'm charged with a certain responsibility. Let's see what it says here. Everybody circle the first two words of this next paragraph. Page 89. Practical experience. Right? How do I learn to sponsor other people? Practical experience. How do I learn to take a man or a woman through the steps? Practical experience. How do I learn how to do things in AA? Practical experience. Nothing more than that. Nothing less than that. And I was grateful to have a sponsor who pushed me into service. And I didn't think that I was ready to sponsor other people. He said, you're ready. You've worked the first nine steps. You have hope for the newcomer. Go out and find somebody to work with, right? And he made me work with somebody, right? Why? Because he knew the truth. And here it is right here. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics, right? In Bill's story, he calls it strenuous work, one alcoholic with another, right? And so it says here, nothing. That's not meetings, not service, right? Not my sponsor, that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking for me as intensive work with other alcoholics, right? 
And that has been one of the great truths of my sobriety, right? And whenever anything has happened in my sobriety and things have happened, I've had certain trials and low spots, right? My mom had cancer 10 years ago, right? And it was bad, you know? She had to have a full mastectomy, right? It didn't look like she was going to make it, right? She's alive today, right? What a blessing that is, right? But guess what? I work with other alcoholics. I had a painful divorce three years ago. And when I went through my divorce, you know what? I was blessed, 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 blessed to have lots of new people around me to work with because it kept me out of myself. And, you know, I thought for a long time that there was some, like, really complex reason why working with others was so vital for a guy like me. And you know what I found out later on? It's not complex at all. It's very simple. It's when I'm thinking about you, I'm too dumb to think about me. Right? I can't think about two things at once. And when I'm thinking about you and I'm helping you, I'm not thinking about me. And it's really that simple. Because me is the problem. And my self-centeredness is the problem. It says here, it works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help where no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, everybody underline this. Remember, they are very ill, right? And I think sometimes that we forget that in AA, don't you? Right? I think that we forget that. Someone. I think that we forget that sometimes, right? And so we have these people come into AA. I saw it a couple weeks ago at a meeting, right? Somebody come to me and they said, oh, this guy came into the meeting and he'd been drinking. I said, no. <laughs> You're kidding me. In an AA meeting, he'd been drinking, right? Okay. But we forget that they're very ill, don't we? Right? And I have to remind myself of that all the time when I'm working with new people, right? Because I was exactly the same way when I come to AA. As a matter of fact, when I came to AA the last time, I'd been in AA not very long, and I decided I didn't like AA, right? So I was going to start my own 12-step program. True story, right? Because I didn't like what they were doing in AA, right? So I got a meeting place, right? I had my own stuff. And I pictured one day they'd have my picture on the wall, like Bill Wilson, you know. It's going to be good. So I said, we're going to have this meeting, you know. It's going to be better than AA, you know. And not one person showed up, you know what I'm saying? I brewed this big pot of coffee, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> not one person. Showed. So I went back. I dragged myself back to the fellowship where I got sober, and they were talking about gratitude, you know what I'm saying? And I'm sitting there, and I'm just stewing, right? I'm stewing because I'm not happy, Right? I'm pissed off at all these people in AA that are bossing me around all the time, right? And then I realized something. I realized that it really wasn't about them. It was really about me, right? It was really about me. And it wasn't Alcoholics Anonymous that was in fault. And I wasn't here to change Alcoholics Anonymous. And I mentor a lot of people. I mentor a lot of people that they don't actually sponsor, and they call me on the phone. And they say, well, we want to change this at our meeting. We want to change that. We want to take the Lord's Prayer out of the end of the meeting. We want to do this, and we want to do that, Right? And I say, really? You want to do that, do you? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Did you come to AA to change AA? Or did you come to AA to change you? Because AA was working fine before I got here, and AA will work fine after Rob is gone. You see, I need Alcoholics Anonymous far more than Alcoholics Anonymous needs me. And so I had to become a part of Alcoholics Anonymous rather than making Alcoholics Anonymous a part of me. The next paragraph says, life will take on a new meaning to watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Notice that it says frequent contact with newcomers and with others is the bright spot of our lives, right? You know, I believe sponsorship is about a couple of things. I believe it's about accountability. I believe it's about transparency, right? Tran accountability, transparency, and I believe it's about following direction, right? And that's what, I, and that's still true for me today. I have a sponsor, and I, I have, by the way, I have a sponsor and I am sponsored. There's a difference, right? There's a difference between having a sponsor and being sponsored, right? There are some people that have a sponsor in name only, right? So they can say that they have a sponsor. And I get guys like that sometimes. They want me to sponsor them, but they already have it in their mind what they're going to do, right? So they call me up, and what they really want is not sponsorship. What they really want is validation, right? 
They want me to go, yeah, I think that's a great idea, right? But you see, my sponsor is the one that I take direction from, right? Because I can't see things clearly. And I'm here to tell you, I'm the kind of guy, again, I'm a skeptic and a cynic, right? And I'm waiting for the day that my sponsor tells me to do something that doesn't work out, and I'm going to throw him right under the bus in a meeting. You know what I'm saying? But it's never happened for me. It's never happened for me in 25 years, and I've always been sponsored. And I have a sponsor who has a sponsor who has a sponsor who has a sponsor. Because you know? I think that's important. right? But you know what's odd? is It's not that I think my sponsor's infallible. I know my sponsor's fallible. right? But you know what I believe is infallible? I believe what's infallible is the power that works through him as he's trying to help me and the power that works through me as I'm trying to help the people that I sponsor. As a matter of fact, I have oftentimes sat there in amazement and heard myself saying things that I need to hear in my own life, right? Because one of the great truths in Alcoholics Anonymous is this, is that the teacher never really learns the lesson until he teaches it to somebody else, right? And how am I going to tell you to do your amend? if I haven't completed mine? How am I going to tell you to go to that meeting if I don't go myself? How am I going to tell you to turn your will and your life over to the care of God if I'm not doing that? Right? And so it forces me into action. And every time I take a guy or a gal through the steps, it reminds me of the action that I need to continue to take on a daily basis in order to stay sober. Right? What a gift. Top of page 90. You know, people often will ask me, well, how do you take a new guy or a new girl through the steps? Because if you read Working with Others and you read it carefully, there's not really direction. There's a lot of direction on how to hook a newcomer, right? But there's not a lot of direction on how to take them through the steps. Why? Because they assume that we're going to take them through the steps the same way they've just shown us how to go through the steps. That we're going to take them through the book. And when I sponsor somebody, I don't give them my sage wisdom and advice. Okay, I would like to. I would secretly like to say that I speak for God, Okay, but I don't, right? And my job as a sponsor is not to give them my sage wisdom and advice. My job as a sponsor is to take them through the 12 steps so they can have a spiritual awakening, and then it's between them and God. Does that make sense to everybody? As a matter of fact, the book says that we have to quit playing God. And so I don't play God to the people that I sponsor. I can't manage my own life let alone manage the lives of the people that I work with. So I don't try. So at the top of page 89, it starts giving us some directions. And we don't have time to cover all of this in detail, but I want to hit a few key points. It says, when you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about him. Everybody underline that, right? I want to point something out here that I didn't see for a long time, right? If you're like me, right, and any old timer will tell you this, this book gets smarter every year, right? I see things in there all the time that I didn't see before, right? I thought, I say, where, when did that appear in there, right? But notice that it says, when you find a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous. I would observe that it does not say, when a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous finds you, right? You know what that means? It means I need to find the prospect. Why? Because nothing is going to so much ensure immunity from drinking for me as intensive work with other alcoholics. I remember when I was early in sobriety, there was an old-timer named Pete G. And Pete was this old-timer from Texas. He was about seven feet tall. And I asked him one day, I said, Pete, have you ever worked with anybody that failed in Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, nope, I've never worked with anybody that failed. I said, what do you mean? I said, how many guys have you sponsored? He said, a whole bunch. I said, really? And none of them have ever failed? He said, nope, I'm still sober. And he walked away. <laughs> right? And you know what? I've worked with a lot of newcomers, too. Some of them have stayed sober, and some of them haven't. You know what? But you know what? I've always stayed sober, right? And that's why I need to find the newcomer, because I need the newcomer more than that newcomer needs me. Jimmy and I were talking about that this morning, right, on our way over here, right? Then I need him more than he needs me. Why? Because I know that I'm going to stay sober today by helping him. And when I help him, it helps me, right? It says find out all you can about him, right? And this is what I call the preliminary questioning, right? Find out about his background and his religious leanings and the seriousness of his condition. You know, find out if he uses drugs in conjunction with alcohol. Find out if he's got a family. Find out if he's got a wife. Find out if he's got kids, you know? Why? Because the book says that I need that information to see how I would like him to approach me if the tables were turned. As a matter of fact, the mission statement of service work is found at the bottom of page 89 in the last three lines. 
It says, because of my own drinking experience, I can be uniquely qualified and useful to other alcoholics. So cooperate. Never criticize. To be helpful is my only aim. And if you want to know how to do service work in AA, that's it right there. Cooperate. Don't criticize. And I hear people all the time, my home group this, my home group that, that one this, that one that, right? Well, if you don't like your home group, then guess what? Why don't you do something about it? If you don't like what you're getting out of AA, why don't you look at what you're putting into AA, right? The problem in Alcoholics Anonymous is we've got 20% of the people doing 90% of the work. Become part of the 20%, right? Become part of the 20%, and you will get all the promises of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I don't criticize AA. My job is never to break down AA. It's to build AA up. My job is never to break down and tear down the guys that I sponsor, although I'm sure sometimes it feels like it. Right? My job is always to build them up. And you know how we do that? We do that by telling people the truth. Right? But you know, one of the things we learn as we improve in understanding and effectiveness is you can be, you can mean what you say to somebody without being mean. And you can level with somebody without leveling somebody. Right? And that's one of the things that we learned here. Right? And so my job with the people that I sponsor is to always try to help them to a better life. Right? Page 91. See your man alone at first if, po uh, if possible. At first engage in general conversation. After a while, turn to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. We will thus get a better idea of how to proceed. If he's not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit, but say nothing for the moment of how this was accomplished. If he's in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles your liquor has caused you, being careful not to moralize your lecture. If his mood is light, tell him humorous stories of your ex escapades, get him to tell some of his. When he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick, Give him the account of the struggles you made to stop. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done on the chapter on alcoholism. We didn't cover it today, but if you've read the third chapter, you know there's some stories in there about some guys. There was Fred the accountant, or excuse me, Fred the, car, uh, Fred the accountant. And Fred the accountant got the idea that he could have a few cocktails with dinner at the end of a perfect day because there wasn't a cloud on the horizon. Right. And then you have Jim, the car salesman and Jim, the car salesman had a great idea. Right. He thought it was OK to have whiskey if only he mixed it with what? With milk. Right. Now, that makes sense to me. Right. Why shouldn't you be able to drink whiskey if you mix it with milk? Right. OK. And it says in here we should show him from our own experience how our drinking was exactly the same way as Jim or Fred. And if you're an alcoholic of my description, every alcoholic has a story like that. Right. I remember one time I was trying to stay sober and I was reading this magazine, right? And on the back of the magazine it had this thing, brew your own beer, right? And I thought to myself, well, if I brewed my own beer, I could probably drink it, right? It made sense to me, right? I didn't see what was wrong with that. But that's that alcohol logic that I always talk about to the guys that I sponsor, right? Page 94. Outline the program of action. Everybody underline that. If I'm going to outline the program of action, then I need to know what the program of action is, don't I? You see, I can't transmit what I don't have. And if I don't have a clear understanding of the program of recovery, can I transmit that to you? No, I can't. If I haven't had a spiritual awakening, can I show you how to have one? No, I can't. And I can have the best of intentions, right? And there are a lot of well-intended people Right? That are trying to help people in Alcoholics Anonymous that are being of disservice rather than they're being of service. And I'm not criticizing, I'm sharing my own experience, because that's what I did. I tried to help people. And my sponsor told me if a blind man leads a blind man, both are going to fall in the ditch. And that's what happened. Because I didn't have a message to carry. And as much as I tried, I didn't have a message of hope to carry to anybody. Because I can't transmit what I don't have any more than I can come back from somewhere that I've never been. Right? Outline the program of action, explaining how you made a self-appraisal, how you straightened out your past, and how you are now endeavoring to be helpful to him. It is important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your own recovery. Actually, he may be helping you 
more than you are helping him. Everybody underline that, right? You know, one of the things that I always say about Alcoholics Anonymous is that Alcoholics Anonymous is what I call the upside-down kingdom, right? It's upside-down. I mean, if you think about it, right, there's things that we talk about in AA that really don't make any sense. We say things like, you got to surrender to what? you got to surrender to win, right? And you got to give it away to, right? And here's one of the things right here. It's you may, he may be helping you more than you're helping him. It's somehow when I serve you, I save me, right? What an interesting thing. As a matter of fact, in Bill's story, he says something that most people don't understand. He says, common sense would thus become uncommon sense, right? Try to explain that to a non-alcoholic. As a matter of fact, go to work on Monday morning and tell people that you have a vital sixth sense and you live in four dimensions, right? See what they say to you. Right? Only an alcoholic of my description understands that, right? Good stuff, right? We're going to turn to page 97. We're actually going to start at the bottom of 96, and this is the last commentary I'm going to make on this, and we're going to do a few things and close it out. I'll try to get us out of here as close to on time as I can. I apologize for running long. At the bottom of page 96, it gives me what I believe is one of the, one of the things I'm supposed to do or not do as a sponsor, right? It says, be sure you use discretion. Be certain that he will be welcomed by your family and that he's not trying to impose upon you for money, connections, or shelter. Permit that and you only harm him. Now listen to what it says. It says you'll be making it possible for him to be insincere. And then it says you may be aiding in his destruction rather than in his recovery. And we don't like to talk about that in AA, do we? Right? But you see, if I let the people that I sponsor get away with what they're not supposed to get away with, if I allow them to be insincere and dishonest with me, then I'm not helping them, right? And I've had to tell more than a number of sponsees that I've taken through the steps, I don't think I can help you because you're not able to be honest with me. And if you can't follow my direction, you should follow the direction of somebody whose direction you can follow. Because if you can't follow mine, then I'm really not your sponsor. You are, right? And I don't sponsor people with two sponsors. And if you're your own sponsor, then I can no longer sponsor you, right? As a matter of fact, I mentioned my friend Kevin Haggerty. And I sponsored Kevin for a long time, and I could speak about him now because he's gone, right? And I sponsored Kevin for about three years. And Kevin was one of those guys. Kevin had what I called the good dope syndrome, right? That's where he thought he was the only one that had the good dope in AA, right? And so he would go to groups and he'd call me on the phone. He'd say, well, they're doing it wrong down there at Central and they're doing it wrong over there in Winter Park. And one group at a time, one person at a time, right, he backed his way out the door of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And my job was to be honest with him. And I was so honest with him to the point where he said he no longer wanted to work with me, right? But here's the thing. I'm here to save somebody's life. And I'm here to save the lives of the people that I sponsor because this is life and death. And I would rather that somebody I sponsor hate my guts, but I'm telling them the truth because I'm not going to preside over someone's destruction, right? I refuse to preside over someone's destruction. And if they have to hate me and they do the work and they have the spiritual experience as a result, then I'm willing to take that risk. But if they can't follow my direction, I'm not going to sit there and aid in their destruction rather than in their recovery, right? The book tells me to never avoid these responsibilities but to be sure I'm doing the right thing if I assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. Everybody underline that. When should I avoid these responsibilities? Never, right? Not on my day off, not on my vacation, not when I don't feel like it, right? I should never avoid these responsibilities. Why? Because every day is the day when I have to carry the vision of God's will into all my activities. That's why. It says a kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You may have to act the good Samaritan every day if need be, right? And I think it's interesting that Bill uses a biblical story here to make a point, right? And for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, the story goes that there was a guy traveling along the road and he got beaten up and left in in the ditch, right? And he was a hated Samaritan. And in those days, the Jews didn't have anything to do with the Samaritans, right? They were warring tribes. They were warring factions. And especially a religious person would never have anything to do with a Samaritan. 
And so along came a priest, right? A religious man, a Pharisee. And he saw this guy bleeding in the ditch, right? They'd taken his clothes. They'd taken his money. He was left there to die. And he passed by him on the other side, right? And then along came another guy, right? And he saw the guy sitting there and he, and he, he did nothing. But then along comes this Samaritan. And he sees this guy in the ditch and he has mercy on him. He has pity on him. And so he picks him up and he puts him on his donkey and he takes him to the nearest town and he puts him up and he bandages him. He bandages his wounds and he tells the innkeeper, I'm going to give you some money now, right? And later, if I owe you any more, I'll come back and pay you, right? And the moral of the story is that here come the religious people. Here come people that should have helped the guy and they didn't. But here came a hated Samaritan, a guy that should have had nothing to do with this other guy, right? But he took the time and had pity and mercy on him, right? And I have to have pity and mercy on the people that I work with too. I have to have pity and mercy on the people down at the detox and the treatment centers. Because guess what? All of us are in here today, but there are thousands of people out there in treatment centers and detoxes and living behind the clubhouses that don't have anywhere to go tonight, right? And all of us, I believe, have a responsibility. As a matter of fact, now that I've worked the 12 steps, do you know that the book gives us a new job description? Did you know that? Turn to page 102 in the big book. Page 102. Bottom of page 102, second to last full paragraph. Your job now, everybody underline that. When is it my job? Is to place myself where I may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives, and God will keep you unharmed. And I've been to some interesting places doing service work in Alcoholics Anonymous, and God has always kept me unharmed. You'll remember that I said when I took the third step, I entered this agreement with God, right? And my part of the deal is I keep close to Him and I perform His work well, right? The book says that I have a new employer. And as a new employer, then God is allowed as my employer to give me a new job description. And here it is right here on 102. My job now is to place myself where I can be of maximum helpfulness to others. So I should never hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand, right? We're going to close this thing out with a couple of footnotes. Everybody turn to page 129. We don't have time to cover everything in here, but I want to cover a couple of quick things. A couple of quick things. You know, one of the things that we talk about in the last part of the 12th step is the idea of putting these principles in all my affairs, right? And especially in the areas where I don't want to. Like, it's easy for me to be this great spiritual guy that you all see in AA, right? But it's difficult for me at work. Sometimes it's difficult for me with my ex-wife. Sometimes it's difficult for me with people that I don't necessarily get along with in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? But there, even more than anywhere else, is where I need to apply. And sometimes people say, well, I'm going to put these principles ahead of your lousy personality, right? Isn't that how we usually say it, right? Do you know what we learn after we're around here long enough? There's only one person whose personality I need to put these principles ahead of. And that's mine, right? Because my personality is really the problem. You know, I remember I was in early sobriety, and I think this is the best example of putting these principles at work in every area of my life that I could give you. And when I was about five years sober, I took up the game of golf. Any golfers in here? Any golfers in here? If you want to learn patience and tolerance, right, take up the game of golf. It's a terrible game for for alcoholics, right? Because it requires patience and it requires, you know, things that alcoholics don't usually have. It requires honesty, right? Can't change your score, right? That kind of stuff, right? And I remember all of my life I'd been a baseball player, right? So I had this beautiful baseball swing. Right. And anybody who knows anything about a baseball swing knows that if you have a perfect baseball swing like I, as a matter of fact, I was a really good baseball player. Some people said I could have even been a pro baseball player. I was that good. Right. But in a baseball swing, you turn your wrists over like that. Right. When you swing the bat. Right. So I thought that you could transfer the skills from baseball to golf. Right. And you kind of can. Right. The problem was I'd go out there to play golf and I'd go to hit the golf ball and I'd turn my wrists over like that. So I would hit this great shot. Right. And I would hook the ball like that, right? And this happened over and over and over again, right? So I knew what the problem was, right? I knew that I had this hook in my swing because I turned my wrist over, right? 
So you know what I did? I did what any other alcoholic would do, right? I watched videos on the problem, right? To help me fix the problem, right? I talked to people about the problem, right? I even got a golf coach to help me with the problem. And we would go out to the driving range day after day after day, and we would hit balls in the same problem, right? I couldn't get rid of the problem, right? But I'll never forget, we were out there one day, and I was working on this problem, right? And I hit this perfect shot, right? Perfect golf shot, right? And, I, and But then I went back to my same problem, right? And he explained something to me that I've always applied to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, Rob, if you will continue to practice your golf swing, the glorious day will come where what you know in your mind and your actions will be in harmony, right? And I'm here to tell you that if you will practice the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous that we have talked about today, in your life, over time, right, the glorious day will come where what you know in your mind is right and your actions will be in harmony, right? Page 129, we're actually going to start at the bottom of page 128. He says, he is not so unbalanced as they might think. Many have experienced dad's elation. We have indulged in spiritual intoxication. Like the gaunt prospector, belt drawn over the last ounce of food, our pick struck gold. Joy at our release from a lifetime of frustration knew no bounds. Father feels he struck something better than gold. For a time he may try to hug the new treasure to himself. He may not see at once that he has barely scratched a limitless load, infinite load, that will pay dividends only if he minds it for the rest of his life and insists on giving away the entire product. You know, there's another book that I read. And people always ask me, they say, Rob, why do you do so much in Alcoholics Anonymous? Right? And I tell them the truth. In this other book that I read, there's a parable. And it's a parable about a guy that's out walking one day in a field. And he's out in the field and he finds a buried treasure. And in this book that I read, it says that he doesn't get sad. He goes and he sells everything that he owns. And he buys that field. But he's not remorseful that he's lost everything that he owns. He rejoices because he's found this new treasure. And if you want to know why I do what I do in Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you want what I have, the answer is very simple. Because I'm that guy. I have found the treasure in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have found the thing that makes me whole. I don't have to be two halves anymore. I can be one whole guy. Right? I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll close it out. You know, there was a guy much like all of us who was sitting in the park doing his 11th step one day, right? And as he sat there doing his 11th step, he was praying to God. He was saying, God, show me how I can serve you, right? And as he was sitting there meditating, he heard this noise, this tap, tap, tap. And it was a blind person coming down the path. It was edging their way along, right? And he was moved. And he said, God, help this blind person and have pity on them, right? And he continued his meditation. And a few minutes later, he heard this rustling. And he opened his eyes and he saw a homeless guy rooting through the trash can, looking for something to eat. And again, he was moved with compassion. And he said, God, please help this homeless person. Have mercy and compassion on him. Right? And not long after that, as he sat there and continued his meditation, he opened his eyes and down the path came staggering this alcoholic with a bottle and a bag, looking for cigarette butts on the ground to smoke, right? And our friend was so moved by what he had seen that he cried out and he said, God, I know that you are a loving and powerful God. How then can you see all this and do nothing? And that intuitive thought in his spirit that God put there spoke to him. And it said, I did do something about it. I made you. I'd like to close by reading something that's from my favorite piece of Alcoholics Anonymous literature. Maybe some of you have read it. Maybe you haven't. It's called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's my favorite piece of AA literature other than our book. And in it is an excerpt from one of our very early pioneering members, 
about what Alcoholics Anonymous is. And if you haven't read this, it is worth reading. Because I think it is one of the most powerful things that we have in AA. And I'd like to end this workshop with this. Because I think it really speaks to what my experience and what all of our experience has been in this great thing we call AA. It says, there must come a day, it seems to me, when every alcoholic, in or out of AA, finally sits down in the presence of his enemies. When he does, he will be amazed to discover that he is attending a meeting of one, himself. The day the alcoholic in AA realizes that his enemy is within, that the tigers are largely creatures of his own design and lurk in his own unconscious, is the day when AA for him becomes what I believe its founders meant to be a flight into reality. Tonight, if I could find one fault with AA, it would be that we have not yet begun to tap the hidden potential behind the last seven words of the 12 steps to practice these principles in all our affairs. It occurred to me not long ago that whenever I'm sitting in a meeting of AA, I am never aware that I'm sitting next to another white man, a Catholic, an American, a Frenchman, a Mexican, a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, a black man, or a brown man. I am aware only that I am sitting next to another alcoholic. And it seemed deeply significant to me that this feeling of common humanity had been purchased at, by me at the much cost and considerable pain and suffering. Should this hard one understanding of and feeling for others be confined to the meeting halls or the members of AA? Or does it remain for me to take what I have learned and what I have experienced, not only in AA, but in every other area and endeavor of my life, to lift up my head and assume my rightful place in the family of man? Can I there in the household of God know that I am not sitting next to another white man, another Catholic, another American, a Frenchman, a Mexican, a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, a, brown, a black man or a brown man, not even another alcoholic? And can I finally at long last Come home from all the wars and say in the very depths of my soul, I am sitting next to another human being. Ladies and gentlemen, who would dare attempt to analyze a phenomena, to diagram a wonder, or parse a miracle? The answer is only a fool. And tonight I trust that I have not been such a fool. All I have tried to do is tell you where I have been these past 16 years and some of the things that I have come to believe become of my, because of my journeyings. This coming Sunday, in the churches of many, there will be read that portion of the Gospel of Matthew, which recounts the time when John the Baptist was languishing in the prison of Herod. And hearing the works of his cousin Jesus, he sent two of his disciples to him to say, Art thou he is who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Christ did as he so often did. He didn't answer them directly. He said to the disciples, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard, that the blind see, that the lame walk, that the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Back in my childhood catechism days, I was taught that the poor in this instance did not only mean the poor in the material sense, but it also meant the poor in spirit who burned with an inner hunger and an inner thirst, and that the word gospel quite literally meant the good news. More than 16 years ago, my boss, my physician, my pastor, and the one friend I had left, working singly and together, maneuvered me into AA. Tonight, if they were to ask me, tell us, what did you find? I will say to them what I say to you now. I can only tell you what I have seen and heard. It seems that the blind do see, the lame do walk, the lepers are cleansed, and over and over again in the middle of the longest day or the darkest night, the poor in spirit have the good news shared with them. May God grant that it always be so. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.